right, so we are going to talk about our last day of unhealthy and abusive relationships. And again, our focus ending yesterday was on abusive relationships. And what we are going to do today is we are actually going to review those 10 warning signs or those 10 um, types of abuse that we see in dating relationships, in high school age relationships, majority of what we're talking about. Um, but then also talk about the cycle of abuse today. And then we are finally going to have you watch another video with a couple um, who are a younger couple and their name is Seb and Allie, and we are gonna walk through their relationship in this video, and then you are going to complete page two and three of the worksheet that you started with the last lesson we did. All right, so again, like I said, we are gonna review the styles of abuse that we saw yesterday in those um, 10 one-minute clips that we watched. We're gonna go over the cycle of abuse and finally watch the video, The Love Labyrinth. So again, to review, we have guilting. When we see guilting in an abusive relationship, and this is one that we have actually witnessed quite a bit, just even at ECU High School, and we've dealt with students who have been in abusive relationships, um, the abuser actually makes the victim feel guilty or responsible for like the abuser's actions. Okay, they will tell the person, well, if I didn't see you talking to that guy, I wouldn't have gotten so pissed off and I wouldn't have hit you. Or they'll say, well, if you wouldn't have dinged my car when you were walking past it, I wouldn't have gotten so pissed and yelled at you. They accuse the, uh, the victim of actually causing the abuse. Um, the second one is belittling. This is where the abuser is going to make the victim feel bad about themselves and how this can look in a high school relationship. And what we've even seen is when a couple is in, say, the same math class and they take the same test and the abuser will talk to the victim and say, hey, how'd you do on that test? Oh, well, I didn't do very well. I, I, I think I might have actually gotten like a C minus or a D. They're like, oh my God, what are you stupid? That was the easiest test I've ever taken. How did you get that bad of a grade? You're an idiot, right? So they make him feel bad. Um, the next two things that we saw yesterday is betrayal and then deflecting responsibility. Betrayal is when your partner acts differently with you than when you're not around. So when they're with their friends or when they're with like even maybe another person that they might have interest in, okay, they really start to act differently and could even like rip on you a little bit or bag on you and kind of badmouth you to these people. When they deflect responsibility, they start making excuses for this poor behavior. Um, and sometimes that excuse can look like, hey, you know what? I just had a really bad day. I'm, so I'm sorry I put my hands on you. I'm sorry I shoved you. Um, I'm sorry I yelled at you. I'm sorry I scared you. I just had a bad day. Okay, where really having that bad day does not excuse poor behavior or abusive behavior is what I should have said. Um, the next two are isolation and intensity. Now isolation, what they do, and we talked about this quite a bit already, but the abuser will intentionally keep their victim away from other friends, other family, and other people. Because when it comes down to it, and maybe the victim gets wise to it and wants to end the relationship, they're like, who are you gonna go to? You have nobody left. You haven't talked to your friends the entire time that we've dated. Okay? You won't tell your family. They're not going to believe you. They actually love me. Every time I come to your house, they think I'm the best thing that's happened for you. Okay, Or and even any other people, like people that you work with, maybe they come to your place of work. Like say you work at Target and they actually come to Target and start like stalking you and protect, being protective of you around your coworkers. So then your coworkers don't want anything to do with you. And again, those are situations that we have seen. Um, and then intensity. So what happens here is that they really have extreme feelings or over the top behavior that just feels like it's way too much where it's almost like suffocating because you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know where that came from. Then we have volatility and jealousy. Volatility is when there's these unpredictable overreactions that make you feel like you need to, what we say, walk on eggshells, meaning that you have to walk very carefully and be very careful about what you say or how you react in front of your abuser. Um, because they could lash out, they could act out on you, even with other people around. This jealousy piece, and again, we talked about that even with unhealthy relationships, but it becomes abusive when someone lashes out or tries to control you because of their jealousy. Like, you don't get to wear that out in public because other people are going to think you're too hot. Okay, You don't get to hang out with that friend because I'm pretty sure that friend wants you. Okay, So they, they actually start controlling bits and pieces of your life because they are so jealous. But then they use love to excuse that jealous behavior. Well, it's just because I love you so much. 
All right, the last two are sabotage and manipulation. With sabotage, the abuser purposely ruins your reputation. They actually will say things behind your back or directly to people with you in front of them, okay, and like make fun of your achievements, make fun of your success, right? And they're actually going to ruin that and can sabotage your life. They can make you late for work. Be like, oh, I just wanna spend more time with you. You're not leaving yet, okay? You don't need a study for that test. Okay, you're you're fine. Even if you get a C, what's the big deal? Okay, so they start to actually sabotage your success in life. And then finally with manipulation is when the abuser tries to influence your decisions, actions, and your emotions, where they are truly getting you to do exactly what they want. I call this the puppeteer, okay, where they are truly controlling every little thing, but they kind of make it seem like it's your idea. All right, so with those 10 types of abuse. And again, you got to see some videos with that yesterday. We are now going to talk about the cycle of violence or the cycle of abuse. So you see the four different parts here. We have the first honeymoon, we have tension building, we have explosion, and then we have the honeymoons after the explosion. So as you look at this, you can probably see how this is going to go. All right, with that first honeymoon, okay, this is right when you first start dating somebody. It's not going to be abusive. Okay, we all, like we give each other stuff. It's almost perfect, right? We are really trying to establish those feelings of love and affection. This is where we are building trust. Now, every relationship typically starts this way, okay? Whether it turns abusive or whether it stays healthy, this is what we do. This is how our human brains operate. Um, and as those feelings of trust increase, the feelings of love follow. Now, what happens in an abusive relationship is exclusive. And especially when we're talking about high school age relationships, I really want you guys to make sure you're being aware of these things, that tension building phase. So when we are looking at that tension building phase, the honeymoon is over, okay? This is where they start name calling, they start making rude comments, they start raising the level of tension in your relationship. This is where the abuser might use jealousy as an excuse for their behavior or because they love you so much, they don't know how to control themselves. And what happens after that tension rises and it starts like the balloon starts to fill up more with air is that you are ultimately going to get some sort of explosion. Now with this explosion, let me get my face out of the way. With this explosion, what you're gonna see is different types of behavior, so different types of abusive behavior. And again, when you went through those 10 styles of behavior or abusive behavior that we already talked about, okay, not one of those had anything to do with the abuser putting their hands on their victim. And that's usually what we think of as this physical violence. But there are other types of abuse as well, as I'm sure you're figuring out. We have direct physical violence, which would mean actually putting my hands on you. Verbal abuse, where I'm just going at you with my words and I make you feel about this big and make you feel terrified of me because I'm just so intimidating with it. Non-direct physical violence, where you know I'm looking through your phone and all of a sudden I realize that you've been snapping the guy that I hate. Maybe it was even Jenny. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I take your phone and I'm chucking it against the wall just to smash your phone. That's non-direct physical violence. And then we have that non-verbal violence. I'm going to use my physical presence to terrify you. Okay. That might mean that I start walking right up to you and I actually walk you back into a wall. Okay. It might mean that I actually like turn my back on you. There's all these different ways that I can send some really clear messages just to make sure that you are still afraid of me and know that I rule this relationship. What happens after the explosion? So this is where we have honeymoons after the explosion. And with these honeymoons after the explosion, the abuser does what Ever it takes to convince their victim that it's going to get better. I didn't mean that to happen. It will never happen again. It can be just like how it was before. Don't you remember how awesome that was? Like when we used to go for like rides at night and we used to just like sit in the parking lots and talk. Okay. So right now the victim is so afraid of the partner's behavior. So they don't even consider leaving. Now, when we are moving forward with this, it takes an average of seven explosions. So seven acts of violence before a victim leaves or something worse can happen. So if you look at how this cycle of violence works, let's look at some observations. So the first thing I want you to observe is the honeymoon length. And that first honeymoon, right, like that's some, like we are laying some groundwork here. Okay, so the honeymoons get shorter and shorter. Now, if any of you have ever trained an animal, okay, so even think if you've ever gotten a puppy and you're trying to like 
potty train the puppy to go outside, right? You're trying to teach it how to sit and stay. You're trying to teach it how to lay down, how to roll over, all these things, okay? Sooner or later, it's going to learn how to do that faster, okay? So with these honeymoons, because it the honeymoon happens after an explosion, it takes a lot shorter of a time for the abuser to get them back into shape, to make them make sure that, nope, we love each other, remember? You know why I did it this time, don't you remember? I still love you, that's why I do it, right? So those honeymoons get shorter and shorter and shorter. The other thing that you're gonna notice is that that tension building gets steeper and steeper as we go, which ultimately leads to those explosions getting more and more and more severe. All right, and again, an average of seven explosions before a victim can get themselves to leave or when something worse can happen to them. So what you are going to do now is you're going to be done with this video and you're gonna go back into Schoology and you're gonna see this video called the Love, Love Labyrinth. Now a labyrinth is like a maze and usually it's like underground and really kind of confusing. All right, so here we have Allie and Seb. And what you're going to do is you're going to complete page two and three of your worksheet that you started with the 10 small videos. And you're going to make some observations based on what you see with Allie and Seb's relationship. All right. So, so to just review the worksheet, you guys filled this part out yesterday and now you're doing worksheet two. So the love labyrinth that says at the top, sometimes abusive behavior is hard to pinpoint. It might not be as clear cut as one partner pushing, grabbing, or hitting another. Oftentimes, people in emotionally abusive relationships don't understand that they're being abused because there's no physical violence involved. Many are going to dismiss or downplay the emotional abuse they experience because they don't think of it as bad as physical abuse because there's no bruises, because there's no marks, because there's no scars. But that's not true. It actually is sometimes harder on your heart and on your brain when you have these non-physical types of abuse happening. So what I want you to do is review the questions that you should be looking for. All right, so this first one says, after watching a snapshot of Ellie and Sub's relationship, you saw the manipulation, intensity, and jealousy that's occurring. So it says here what should happen in a, in a healthy relationship. Then you're going to answer, what do you think the problem in Allie and Sub's relationship is? What unhealthy behaviors did you observe in the relationship? Question two, think to yourself, if you ever have been in a situation where someone you were dating or friend is constantly trying to reach you through text or calls, how would that make you feel and why? Question three, during the video, Seb demonstrates his anger and asserts his control through violence by throwing stuff and punching a steering wheel. How does the use of violence serve to assert power and control over another person? Question four, in that last scene, we see Allie walking back into the apartment and embracing Seb in a hug. Why do you think she does this? What might, why might someone who experiences unhealthy or abusive behavior from another partner stay in that relationship? And then question five, reflecting on, it, what, reflecting on what is lacking in Seb and Allie's relationship, what are three healthy relationship behaviors that you think are important in all relationships? And explain to me why you think these three are important. Okay, so this is where the video is done. You're going to go back into Schoology and you are actually going to find the video and again, go side by side with it. And then you're going to answer the questions on page two and three and then turn that worksheet into Schoology and we will see you guys later. Bye-bye.